the temperature hits 36 degrees, 30 degrees colder than any previous shuttle launch. Two thousand miles away at Morton Thiokol, Beaujolais and his colleagues are also watching. Good morning, Greg. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, we're going to go. Thirty seconds before liftoff, the onboard computers take over. They make the remaining thousands of decisions. T minus 16 seconds, sound suppression water starts. The final countdown begins. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. Six seconds before takeoff, the three huge engines ignite. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one. It launched and the air cracked with that six and a half million pounds of thrust and the ground shook and uh, they were off. Lift off. Lift off of the 25th space shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. No one has noticed as the shuttle rises from the launch pad is a puff of black smoke from the lower part of the right-hand booster. Due to the cold conditions, the O-ring has not expanded to seal the gap. Hot gases are leaking. The pressure of the gas has pushed aside the second backup O-ring. And we're sitting there, and the vehicle ignites and clears the launch tower, and I turn to Bob and whisper. Looks like we dodged the bullet. Because we had all expected it to blow up in a pad. Because that's what the propellant experts in engineering had told us. Roger, roll, program. Roger, roll, Challenger. Roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engine's beginning throttling down now at 94%. Intense hot gases within the right-hand booster begin to blow by the damaged first O-ring. 56 seconds into the flight, an entire section of the first O-ring has burned away. Hot gas starts to stream out past the displaced second O-ring. Cameras on the ground show a plume of fire from the booster. The flame is eating away at the wall of the booster, burning a bigger and bigger hole. 61 seconds. The flame is now in contact with the bottom of the external fuel tank, which contains flammable liquid hydrogen. Three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells. 64 seconds. The flame burns a small hole in the tank. As the hydrogen begins to burn, the plume changes shape. No one on the ground is aware of what is happening. 70 seconds. The flame burns through into the hydrogen tank. Pressure in the tank drops. Engine's throttling up. Three engines now at 104 percent. Counter, go and throttle up. At 72.3 seconds, the flame burns through the support that attaches the right-hand booster to the base of the external tank. The booster starts to swivel. The lower end swings outwards. At 72.5 seconds, the nozzle at the base of the right-hand booster swivels sharply to counteract the swinging motion. A violent shudder goes through Challenger. 72.6 seconds. Hydrogen is now pouring out of the bottom of the tank, where the strut has burned through. 72.9 seconds. The instruments go haywire. They are rapidly running out of fuel. At 73.1 seconds, the bottom of the hydrogen tank falls away. The force of the erupting gas pushes the tank up into the base of the oxygen tank. The nose of the swiveling booster hits the top of the external tank, ripping it open. 
there is a sudden brilliant flash as the oxygen and hydrogen mix. 73.5 seconds. Challenger's engine shut down. The last data from Challenger is radioed to Earth. The explosion blasts the shuttle free. It is tumbling through the atmosphere at 1,250 miles per hour. The enormous stress tears the shuttle apart. The nose section is torn off. It contains the crew cabin and the seven astronauts. The cabin is still heading upwards, but air resistance is slowing it down. On the ground, people begin to realize what has happened. Something is terribly wrong. And then, all of a sudden, it, it looked different. And then, it began to shatter in a million pieces. Just like our hearts. that the vehicle has exploded. My director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking. All of the families, we all look to each other with what has happened. They all look to me. Steve, in particular, I remember his eyes. He, he, he was in shock as well. We were numb. There were no words. Someone spoke up and said, uh, we have to take care of these families and get them back to crew quarters. So they put us on the bus. We could see that uh, Kennedy Space Center had absolutely come to a halt. And there was just crying everywhere. So um, I knew then that there was no chance that that... Um, that Dick was able to fly the orbiter back safely to uh, the launch pad or anything. The crew cabin is torn off in the massive explosion. At least three of the crew are able to turn on their emergency air supplies. But at this point, the cabin is almost certainly depressurized. The crew would lose consciousness within seconds. The cabin takes almost two minutes to fall back to Earth. It is destroyed on impact as it hits the sea at 200 miles per hour. No one survives. I went to Dick's room and found his, um, well, first, I went to his room to weep privately. I, I took Dick's briefcase back out and set it in my lap along with his parents and our children. And uh, it was um, why I would do that, I don't know, except that it was so much a part of him, it was always with him. And um, it had his, his mem uh, memorabilia in it, it had his everyday things that the kids and I always saw him with, his star charts, his business cards, and he had uh, taped on it some of the emblems from space and so forth. And, and we looked through it together. And um, out on top was... Um, a paper on his in his handwriting that was a message uh, about uh, the pioneer spirit and how important it, space exploration was. We have whole planets to explore. We have new worlds to build. We have a solar system to roam in. And if only a tiny fraction of the human race reaches out towards space, the work they do there will totally change the lives of all the billions who remain on Earth. 